Hello, manufacturing world. I'm Wade Anderson with Shop Matters, sponsored by Akuma America. This podcast is created to discuss all things machining and manufacturing. In the studio with me today, I've got Jeff Estes with Velocity Products and Chris Peluso with Akuma America Corporation. Jeff, tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your background? Oh, well, first of all, I'm glad to be here. appreciate the opportunity to just talk, but I've been in manufacturing my whole life. I started in manufacturing in uh, 1978, uh, joined it again and coming out of college in 1982 and have worked in machining and metal removing up to this day and just absolutely love it and uh, just say that I've been one of those that's blessed, never had a day of unemployment in all that time. So that's excellent. Appreciate so, the opportunity. Yeah. I appreciate you being here. I'm yeah. going to age myself. So I was four years old when you got started in manufacturing. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> man, you had to say it, too, yeah. didn't you? You had to go there. So thanks. No, thank you. Chris, tell us a little bit about you. I'm a lady applications engineer over at Akuma, and I won't let you know when I got started in manufacturing <laughs> because uh, you got started before I was born. Um so Thank what, you so much. You? I feel really young now. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> what got you into manufacturing? How'd you wind up in this industry? Uh, it was 3D modeling. Uh, drafting is where I started, and I wanted to do something a little bit more advanced than just, you know, straight line drawing. Uh, from the modeling, it went on to land tool paths on parts. Okay. And then running machines, and from there on, I don't know, that was probably about 10 years ago when I started all that. Excellent. Well, today's topic, we are going to do a little bit of a deep dive on gear milling, gear manufacturing on, uh, let's say, non-traditional gear cutting equipment. Is that fair to say? Sure. Multitasking machines. Multitasking. All right. Are we going to talk about turret lays as well, or are we just going to talk about multifunction, or what do you you think? I say both. Okay, cool. Cool. Peel the onion on all of it. There you go. There you go. So, Chris, a little bit on gear cutting. I know a lot of the Akuma machines come with a gear cutting software. Can you tell us just kind of an overview of what that entails? So, uh, simply, it is a user interface, graphical user interface that allows an operator to input some values that they'll take off a gear data table and uh, cut or print, put them together, and it'll make a program for them. Okay. So you're not having to think about really what you have to do to drive the machine anymore. So this is shop floor programming? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's kind of conversational, but not like an AOT product or something like that. It, it's really, it's, it looks more like a spreadsheet, right? Here's what we're looking for for number of teeth on the part, number of teeth on the cutter, and then a little bit about how you want to cut the part, and there generates the program. Okay. Very good. Well, that's a lot easier than what I had to do back in the 80s when we were trying to make gears. And As I say, no gear actual control. gears to change, oh, just numbers. Man. And you had to calculate ratios and everything else and do all the math. Man, that's sweet. Mm-hmm. Sweet. It's all about making it easier on the operator. I think Akuma's focused on that for a while. So I just recently got back from the Emo show over in Hanover, Germany, Um We had a a multifunction machine, one of our Maltus machines set up doing gear cutting. But as I walked through the entire trade show, that was a a huge focus. I noticed pretty much every builder, every booth had some kind of a gear uh, cutting demonstration of some sort. Are you seeing this to be more and more prominent that uh, people are doing gear cutting on uh, kind of go back to that non-traditional gear cutting machines? Yes, absolutely. Just like all machines gear cutting dedicated gear cutting machines age two and now guys are looking to replace those and they're saying well if we go to a lathe be it turret lathe or multitasking lathe or even a five axis machining center we can start doing some of these other operations besides just put a gear on them okay right so you get a lot of diversity out of a part or versatility out of a machine tool okay well wait as akuma has always said though the some of the benefits is you're doing it all in one so now you've got all of your geometries and all the relationships of these parts now they're consistent in that one process you don't have all the the whip from op 10 op 20 op 30 you don't have to keep all that stuff there your tooling simpler the work holding simpler so man and your dimensional accuracies are better great point absolutely so just many many reasons why people are going uh, that process so talk a little bit about what type of gears do you typically see that people are doing on machines like like what we're discussing well it, it, it's all over the place but what you probably noticed at emo is skiving and the big thing that people are trying to get away from is shaping 
right? Shaping is long, slow gear manufacturing process where skiving is a high speed process. All right. So define that for me. What's the difference between skiving versus skiving? Uh, what did I just say? Uh, shaping versus skiving. So shaping, you're really, the cutting style is very similar, but the cutter, uh, skiving cutter is going to be tilted at roughly 20 degrees. And it's going to allow the cutter to just go quicker through the material. You're talking increases from, say, 90 minutes apart to 15 minutes apart. Okay. Right. So huge, huge cycle time savings. And that's exactly what we see in our tool holders as well. Um, we, we call it broaching, shaping uh, on these. It's by all means the easiest process and the most universal, but it's by far the slowest. Uh, so you just have to look at the application. Where does one fit in to the other? But Chris is 100% on the money. Skiving is quick, makes a very good high-quality uh, gear, very good in high production. Uh, so really a, a OD and ID? Both. Yeah. Both. Both. Okay. The, the biggest gain is on the ID. Okay. Yeah. All right. And that's because where a traditional broaching or shaping type yeah. process would take because, place. Because hobbing is quick on the OD. Mm -hmm. uh, but. As Chris was saying, skiving on the ID is really fast and broaching is so slow. Broaching or shaping is just slow compared to that. Well, and to that point, even having a reciprocating broach like Velocity carries That's right. is, is even quicker a lot of times than going to a standard vertical broach that is dedicated to just that. And with their tools, it's a change the end effector and cut a new part. All right, so let me hit the pause button. We've thrown out a lot of terms real quick. That's For people point. that aren't as familiar with gear cutting, Good Jeff, point. Talk about what are the three main types of cutting operations that, that you would be involved with. Okay. So let's go into the three types that really that we, we have tool holders for, and we, we offer that to go on both uh, multifunction lathes like a, a Kuma Multis or a turret-style lathe like an LB3000 or an LU3000. Um, there's really three technologies. Skiving, which we, we can talk about is very fast, is... Uh, directional uh, rotational uh, cutting with uh, opposite directions cutting tool maybe going uh, clockwise the part going counterclockwise extremely fast extremely accurate uh, and uh, creates just a, a great great quality uh, spline or gear tooth uh, in doing that um, hobbing which is more traditional mainly OD if you would uh, but a very good function uh, mainly on turret type uh, machines that you'll see those type tool holders on, uh, but still traditional makes a very good quality and is uh, uh, very quick as well. And then the last one would be broaching shaping, which we make a broaching tool uh, that goes into a live turret type machine that you actually make one profile at a time, whether it's a, a, a spline or a gear tooth. You're making one at a time. Now, it's very flexible and very universal, but it's the slowest of the three, by all means. So mm -hmm. uh, those are the three terms you'll probably hear, skiving, hobbing, broaching, shaping. Okay. okay. And there, there really is a fourth, too, which is uh, profile cutters or gashing cutters, which you can mount into an LB or a, yeah. a Maltus style by using a driven turret. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. But again, that's a single tooth at a time yeah. process. It's, that's right. It's not ideal, but it's good for really large gears. Yeah, you're right. That's a good point. Good point. So what does a customer need to know if he's going to uh, look at using a turret lathe or a multifunction machine? What does he need to know to actually get started and start producing uh, gear profiles? Don't do it in a vacuum. I like that. Okay, so <laughs> define that for that, me a little bit more. That's the biggest issue that I run into is the customer may call a distributor or a machine tool manufacturer or it may call a tooling vendor or it may call a tool block, each independently. And, and you really have to have the conversation from the very beginning with everybody involved, right? It, it, you can't, because at any given time, a cutting tool manufacturer may say, oh, well, I can't do that, or a tool block supplier, oh, I can't supply the tool, or the machine tool guy may say, oh no, you have tool interference with this you know, feature. So it can all fall apart at any given time. So everybody has to have that conversation the whole way through from basically its genesis to its implementation. You, you just can't do it piecemeal and with different people. It doesn't yeah, work. Like that. 
So, so true. We, we always request a drawing of the part or at least the gearing or spline profile so we can see, first of all, what are you trying to do and what may be the best approach to it. Um, also, let's face it, you've you got to have a good machine to put it on. I mean, you, you just, uh, fortunately, a Kuma is a premium machine, highest quality out there, and, and it, it has no problems. The rigidity, the speed, all the things that, that go with that type of machine. But if you go on a lesser machine or a weaker or less rigid machine, you're probably not going to get the quality of gear that you want as well. So those are questions that we ask as well. Well, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of questions in, in regards to support. Right, oh, yeah. a lot yeah. of customers don't think about a steady rest or a tailstock might be necessary to support a part, right? And then they try and put one of these gear cutting tools into it and realize, oh, wait a minute, there's interference with the tailstock, hmm. right? So it, you got to think about it all together at the same time. So yeah. that is so wise. Chris is right on the money because not only do you have to look at that tool station but the adjacent tool stations what are you trying to do with those are you going to get into an interference uh, for the work holding or the part itself and have you modeled it have you put your basic models in there just to see if you have any interference so Mm -hmm. excellent point and jeff do you guys do any work like that from a tooling standpoint if somebody comes to you uh, requesting uh, live tools of some sort excellent question We, we supply the 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 tool holder if you would uh, what the machine would drive that holds the actual cutting tool we're going to go to the application engineers of both akuma and all the distribution to kind of see and and to the other machine tool builders and go say hey you know how, how, do, how would you approach this we're thinking of this these are some options this is what the customer wants to do and mm-hmm. then we we go to a, a higher level type person to really help us with that technical side. Okay. How about the cutting tools themselves? Uh, the hobs, the the inserts that would go into a broaching tool. What's your experience there? There's a handful of really good manufacturers out there. Um, we are we are technically partnered with a few of them. You know, Sambic. I work directly with a lot. In fact, I was on the phone with them on the way over here. Um, but Star SU and is another fantastic avenue that we have for getting tools. There are mm-hmm. some guys that don't work with us directly because we're in competition with them, right? There are other guys that make cutting tools and machine tools at the same time, so it Got becomes it. a little bit tricky to work with them. Okay. What about lead times? What do lead times look like if, if a guy is going to take, maybe he's got a machine already on his floor, he wants to get started in the cutting uh, gear shapes, what type of lead times are a lot of these tools stuff that's available off the shelf or these custom built applications? Well, it really begin, be, uh, depends on the profile he's trying to make too. If he's making a standard profile or a keyway or a standard uh, spline, those inserts are gonna be readily available in the tool holders as, as well as the, the tool holders that we provide, the driving tool holders. So we may be looking at four to six weeks, but if they get into a special profile, you could easily stretch out to double that time to to really go into that. And, and that's where we see a lot of customers asking us questions. Mm-hmm. They'll come back and, well, I have a special profile or I need this or I need a special need. So okay. it's a great question, you know, and that's where Chris, don't go into it blindly, his comment, mm-hmm. wise. You know, start getting more and people, more people engaged early in the process and start talking through it. That way we're partnering with everyone instead of just throwing parts at and trying to come up with a solution. Right. Yeah, the what and how makes a big difference because you may be able to set up a reciprocating broach head on a particular part and be going, if you can grind the insert in a few weeks, but if you've decided, okay, well, we have to skive this, it might be a few weeks for you even to get a concept drawing, it, right, it, and a few months to get a tool. Great example is we had a customer just last week that wanted to do a four-inch long uh, spline on the ID of a gear. Well, we immediately told them, sorry, that's not the solution for broaching and shaping because usually it's about two and a half inches. It's your stroke, your maximum stroke. So there has to be a different solution for that, uh, for the lens. And that was just a quick look. They thought that they could do it. We really can't. Hmm. You know, so. Okay. So what else is involved when it comes to manufacturing gears? What about work holding? Is that a... It's got to be good. Um, (laughs) I mean, you know, run out is huge. And 
I think a lot of people don't think about gear, especially if they're not making them. The tolerances are tighter than normal parts. Okay. Yeah, and, and what Chris, I'll go into a little bit more. Uh, it's it's the the machine tool itself. You're trying to synchronize the motion of two rotary axes as well as at least one linear axis. So you're trying to synchronize all this and maintain a profile. And uh, where Chris was going into skiving, the rotational speeds of skiving are very fast mm -hmm. and they're opposite directions. So now how do, you, how do you synchronize these things in opposite directions? And it may be at different rotational speeds. Well, will be. Yeah, and, and then you've got a linear axis you're trying to move at the same time puts a big demand on the accuracy of the machine. So having a good foundation to start with is critical. Mm -hmm. Then you've got to have a good tool holder that's going to be able to accurately transfer that motion that the machine's given to it. And then you've got to have quality tools. At mm -hmm. the same time, where Chris was going on the work holding, you've got to be able to hold it accurately, no vibration, no moving around, position it the same way repeatedly. Just all kinds of things. That's where, again, don't go into this in a vacuum. There's a right. lot going on. What about inspection? You can cut a tool. How do you know you're making a good tool? Well, the, you know, a lot of these guys have their own inspection equipment on site. That's really what you got to rely on, right, is the, the knowledge of the customer. And that's why, say, us and a cutting tool manufacturer can't just make up a solution without the customer's involvement. Right. Obviously, if they've never made the part before, they need to think about, are we going to just get a no-go gauge or are we going to um, go to third party or purchase some equipment in-house? Uh, on some machines, you do have gauging, mm -hmm. right? So you can use a tactile probe and some, we do have a software that's, we're partnered with Hexagon Metrology on a machine tool that can actually check the profile, the lead, the run out of gear, right? And generate your, your typical line charts. Uh, and, and on top of that, the newest technology is vision systems where you're visually checking that spline and gear. And uh, that technology continues to emerge and become more and more accurate every day and very, very fast and being able to compare it to a good profile of what you actually have. So. Uh, as Chris said, there's several places and several companies you could go to. Hexagon's a great example uh, where you can get that type of technology to check. But it could be as simple as a go, no go, or just making sure that, hey, this, this fits in that criteria. And then okay. you do checking later, you know, okay. to get. Very good. So, Jeff, any new products on the horizon? What's, what's velocity? What's the future look like for what you guys are doing you know the biggest challenge is um there there's three major players in gear cutting you've got the machine tool builder you've got the cutting tool the actual one that makes the chip and then you've got some type of holder especially in a turret type uh, lathe that you've got to connect all these well Everyone's developing new stuff every single day. So there, we constantly have to develop new ways and new ways to drive it because cutting tools are getting better every day. Machine tools are faster, more accurate, more rigid every single day. And then how do we build holders that complement that instead of distracting from it? And, and yes, so there's constant development of these, constant changes. And... Um, we're continuing to work on skiving. It's the uh, latest and greatest and thing right now, and uh, we're trying to uh, figure out how to get faster and faster with our rotational or the cutting tool. Okay. Yeah. So, Chris, all your experience at Akuma, what's uh, what's new, exciting stuff that you've been working on? Oh, I can't talk about that kind of stuff. Not allowed. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, but indulge us. If, if you, <laughs> you tell us you got to kill us kind of thing? Yeah. You, um, you get involved in a lot of the skunk work projects. Yeah. Mo most of my projects have sheets over them. But, um, you know, in regards to what Akuma's working on, it, it's always developing something simpler and what the customer wants, right? So we've got small aerospace companies out in L.A. pushing us to do things that two years ago we would say, no, we can't do that, right? It's, 
it it's not a machine that's built for that and today it's oh well so we're working towards it we'll get an answer for you you know we've got mm -hmm. something it works but it's not refined yet so it's amazing to me to see how many operations are done on machine tools uh from i first started machining in the early 90s and you look at it today and sometimes the outside shape of the machine looks the same but you look at the products coming out it's mind-boggling what's coming out of these you you simply didn't cut gears on the lathe you know hmm. 30 years ago you, it just wasn't a process that you did now it's very very standard and very very common and uh, as chris said um, people are wanting to do more if less mm -hmm. uh, machine tools um are expensive they made a huge investment especially in a high quality machine tool and they want to do as much as they possibly can with that and uh, that's where customers are driving us how do we you know i've got a limited floor space i've got a limited number of machines i want to be able to do these processes how do we do them and uh, you know us working together as is, is just partners really makes that happen and we have to you know, mm -hmm. no one has the, the magic wand that makes everything work, but together we do, and that's what we do. Yeah. Well, and really it's allowing the customer to control their business. Um, the, the company that I was out with in L.A., they were having to send their parts to Canada to have just the gears put on them. So they'd turn the whole shaft, send them to Canada, but they had to wait to have enough of them to make it worthwhile to send them then they'd come back right so then they'd stop at the border each way they'd be processed in canada it would take them one week to do all of their work on the part but then it was taking a week and a half for it to leave their building go up be machined and come back so they were putting double the time in when they're saying if we could do this in house you know we'd have control again and all the transportation costs and the opportunity for damaging, uh, packing and unpacking, and all those other costs that come into play. So, great point. What about skills needed from the operators? What kind of special um, skills, what kind of experience do they have to have? Um, Is there things that we do from a software perspective or tooling perspective that helps take some of the uh, higher level skill set? I mean, Need it's away. nothing that can't be learned, but, you know, it's like all things cutting. It, it's methodical, and it needs to be looked at that way, mm -hmm. right? So I don't know if there's a school you could go to to learn it other than the machine you're working on. I mean, that's how I got it. Well, uh, many of the technical colleges are starting to show uh, hobbing and uh, broaching, specifically skiving is something they're just starting to uh, teach students on but they're they're advanced students it's not you know the first six months is usually uh in the latter parts of either getting their degree or their certificate um, but this is this is a complex process mm -hmm. uh there's a lot of pieces that have to work very well together to get the profiles and the quality that you want uh akuma's made it easier with this gearing option software and uh chris that that sounds really exciting because you know you used to have to get your your calculator out and calculate all kinds of unbelievable arcs and angles and feeds and ratios and now the software does a lot of that for you yeah because we really are moving from a mechanical to an electrical world that's a good way of putting it that's a really good way of putting it so although the software's made it simpler. You still need to have someone who understands what's happening, mm -hmm. what, what what the machine's trying to do, what the tools are trying to do. Well, and here, the biggest thing for, like, myself is I need to go to guys that have the 20, 30 years experience to figure out how to troubleshoot what I just got, right? So I get a gear chart back, and I don't really know what all the – the secrets that it's telling me are so i got to go to one of these sage guys out in the back corner that actually knows what it says and figure out okay now that they've told me that how do i make the machine act the way i want it to you seen don't guys, have the harry potter wand that just makes <laughs> things happen you know what's, what's i've the seen deal? guys that can you know they just look at the surface finish coming off the tooth they can see from the the scallops of the cutting and, and different things the surface finish uh visually and know what kind of adjustments have to be made so having that uh that like you say the the tribal knowledge of gear manufacturing is huge yeah and looking at that gear envelope and the curve on the gear so you get the right contact and the right contact points for longevity that's that's something that 
the, the people just don't pick up is something that we need to know. So, uh, but it is, it's, it's a group effort. You know, how do you uh, get all the, the three, four, five important aspects together? Um, how do you think the e-mobility, the electronic mobility, as cars are becoming more and more uh, motorized from a, uh, you know, you look at the Teslas and people like that, how do you think that's going to affect the gear industry moving forward? Well, there's, there's, still, there's still gears. Uh, there not maybe as many. Uh, which there won't be. You won't have as big a transmissions and stuff. There's still going to be gears that have to be made. Um, electric motors have a tendency to make whining noises as they go faster and faster. So you want there. There's going to be a drive, continual drive to get that noise down. Gears can't make noise as electric motors are quieter than gas motors. You're going to pick up of any gear noise. So the mm. quality of gearing that has to go into the transmission side. It's actually going to have to be really high to reduce the gear noise, or we're going to complain about it from the interior of the car because I can't listen to my Bose stereo. So. I've, I've got an old Jeep CJ7. I've got a <laughs> yeah. rock crusher. And, yeah, there you uh, go. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You talk about noisy going yeah. down the road. There you go. So uh, so the electric uh, electric cars, uh, it's, it's going to continue to drive this evolution, and in some cases a revolution, um, to change things, to try to do it better, to look at it at a different approach. It's also going to bring volume into it. There's going to be volume in a different area than what we may just see in a traditional. Especially because uh, there'll be less traditional machining for an correct. electric car. That is correct. Right, so you, the, the suppliers are going to have to be able to do more. That's right, they're going to have to add that value of adding gears as well as just standard machining parts. And, and I asked Chris earlier, he was talking about 3D modeling, and I asked him about, well, how does that relate to 3D printing? And a lot of people think that uh, 3D p- printing or additive manufacturing is going to fix all this. You just put it in, it makes it, and everything's perfect. The quality that we need for for those type of gears, it's not going to be there, especially in today's technology. So we've got to machine it. We've got to do something to bring the quality level up. Beyond At least a finish, finish That's machining, correct. right? To get Some that the... noise down and that longevity that we want. All right. That's an interesting look. All right. Well, we're running uh, close to our time limit here, but I do want to thank you guys for coming in and Thanks talking with us, us today. Um, Again, my name is Wade Anderson with Shop Matters. Uh, Please feel free to reach out to us with questions, comments, and any ideas for future podcasts. Till next time.